Okay, let me share my screen here. Okay, screen one. Okay, um, today, um, let me play around a little bit here with uh, uh, generating uh, random numbers in, in Excel and why that might be of interest, at least of interest to me and uh, how I generate random numbers that have different properties and and, and I'm trying to illustrate some things you may have learned in your uh, statistics course and uh, show you how these things occur which you may not have looked at I don't know what kinds of things uh, people do in the statistics in the statistics course at UCA. So let me just play around with this uh, a little bit. Um, OK, I have my spreadsheet up there and the. Function that I use to generate random numbers, uh, I'll confess here pretty much I've only used this one function. Now, there are a few others than this one, but let me let me put up this one and because for using this one function it's possible to generate random variables according to any probability distribution. Uh, I'm not going to go into that today. You know, that's really uh, something for your statistics course, but let me show you how I generate this one kind of random variable, and I will manipulate it a little bit for you to see how I do things. And then I'm going to use these numbers <laughs> generate uh, some uh, interesting results, I hope. Okay. Getting some noise there in the background. Uh, maybe somebody has a microphone on and they could turn it off. I appreciate that. Hey, thanks. I don't hear the noise anymore. Sounds like you have a lot of activity going on. Maybe uh, dinner time where you are. I just uh, finished eating breakfast and I have my cup of coffee here. My important cup of coffee. This is my drug of choice. Yeah, OK, already I'm feeling better. Um, OK, now the. Uh, the function that I use to generate random numbers is the rand function. So let me I want to generate a hundred thousand random numbers down the A column. And uh, so let's talk about how to do that. OK, right here in cell A1, I select it and I'm going to write the function equals. Rand. Open close parentheses like that. And um, and then I'll hit return. OK, now. What this generates right here is a random value that's uniformly distributed between zero and one. That means that this can take on any fractional value uh, between zero and one. And here it's taken 0.8. And I could generate a different random variable. Let me just go over here. I do it when I want to generate new values. This is what I do. It's I've never seen anybody recommend it, but uh, that's what I do. Uh, I'll just type something, anything, and I hit return. And when I do that, it generates, it reruns the spreadsheet, generates a new random number. I hit one again, you hit return. There's another one, one again, and then return. So it can generate any number, and, and so we're like, as likely to get any fraction as any other fraction. So the probability that these numbers are between zero and one half is exactly the same as the probability that they're between one half and one. So let me just delete all those. So 
that's how I generate a ra uh, that random number. Now, but how do I do 100,000 numbers down here? I mean, I could click and then drag down the corner like that. Uh, but that seems like a particularly, I mean, undo, undo autofill. That seems like dr even dragging down 100,000 could make your uh, your fingers tired on the mouse. So uh, here's a way to do it in Excel. Uh, I, I'm going to copy this. So I select this cell, it's already selected, but I click on it and select it. And then I'll copy it. I'm gonna use my keyboard commands to copy. I hope it works. There we go. Now I click on the A there and it selects every cell in column A as far down as the spreadsheet goes. I don't remember how far that is, pretty far. And then I do paste. So I'll do the keyboard paste command. And it didn't work. OK, boy, that's the first time in my life something didn't work. Here, let me, let me undo, undo everything, Tr try this again. OK. Here, I've selected these three. Let me delete that too. OK, let me try this again. I select and I copy and I do this and I do paste. There, I must have been doing something wrong. And uh, so now I have 100,000 random numbers all the way down as far as the column A goes. Now at this point, I may want to put in a heading for the, for that right there and I could click on this and I could delete that and type a heading. Uh, I'm not going to do that now. No, well, maybe I should here there. OK, I'll put uniform. And it, to represent that it's a uniform distribution, I'll put zero comma one. So it's uniformly distributed between zero and one there. Now, suppose I wanted to generate not uniform zero one, but uniform minus one half to one half. I can use these same random numbers. So this is what I'm gonna put in this column. Uniform minus one half to one half, like that, there. And all I do to generate these random numbers is I can use these random numbers here, equal, and I'll do this, and I'll subtract a half, which I'll write as 0 0.5, like that. So I take the uniform 0, 1. They said they found a typo in my formula. I know what the typo is. Uh, OK, I wanted to put a. There, that'll work, but I, I don't need the parentheses in this one. I could take both parentheses out, but if I'm going to put a parentheses in, I have to put in two parentheses. Excel doesn't like it if you only put in one. So there, so this is now this number and I've subtracted a half from it. So if this is uniform zero one. This is uniform minus a half to a half. And then this, I could copy down all the way to the end. I'll do it the same way. I'll copy this, I'll click on this, I'll paste. There, there we go. And uh, no, there. Okay, now let me type in here. I shouldn't have done that before. I mean, uh, because it 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 filled in it filled in my my uh, my function. Let me rewrite this here: uniform minus one half minus point five comma point five there like that. Hit return. OK, that's uniform minus a half to a half using uniform zero one. Now suppose I want it to go uniform from negative one to plus one. OK, 
Okay. Uh, I could take here, whatever is it here, and I multiply it by two. Because two times negative a half is negative one, and two times a half is one. So let me type that here. I'll do equal and two times whatever this number is there. Now, it's possible if I if this was my desired final result, I could have combined all of these steps into the statement of this function here. Um, but let me, I do it separately, one at a time, so you can see exactly what I'm doing. So this is now uniformly distributed between negative one and one. So here, this number is 0.866 and so on. I subtract a half, the 0.866 becomes 0.366. I multiply this by two, and it becomes this, and then this is uniform negative one comma one, like that. Okay, so, and uh, you see every time I, I on my uh, spreadsheet, on my computer, you know, every time I add something and hit return, it regenerates a brand new random number in all of these uh, cells here. So the 0.14 over here now becomes negative 0.7 here. Okay, so that's how I uh, generate uh, some random numbers. They all have a uniform distribution, but it's a uniform distribution over a different range of values. Now, I thought I would do an example uh, to illustrate polls and how polls work. Whenever here it's election season in the United States. And so you have all sorts of people going out and they're doing polls. Who's going to vote for Trump? Who's going to vote for Biden? And they're trying to predict the outcome of the election. And as you may know, uh, polls are always not completely accurate. And also, as you probably know here, let me let me generate these numbers. Sorry, let me continue. I mean, copy. There, click on this and do paste. There. Now I'll put in a uniform. Uniform. Um, minus one. Comma one. There. OK, now, as you know, polls are not always accurate. Uh, they're approximately true, but polls will, might tell you that somebody's going to win by one percentage point. And frequently, when they quote a poll, at least uh, here in the states, if the when you and whenever you do a polling, statistically, you know that your polls might be an error because you might mistakenly only poll a group of people who would vote for candidate A rather than candidate B. So your poll is going to say that candidate A is going to win, even though the majority of the population might prefer candidate B. Now statistics gives us a way of determining how accurate the polls are. Now I'm not going to go into that, how you do that. I'm going to demonstrate it. So I'm not going to go into theory of why polls how you determine the accuracy of a poll. What I'm going to do is illustrate that. And um, so I want to generate, uh, so assume here I have 100,000 people. And over here, 
half of the people prefer a negative number and half of the people prefer a positive number. That's what I have right here. Now let me let me change this function here a little bit for this number. So let me go back up in here. Or here. OK, right here. Here I have two times B2. And um, I'm going to make it so these numbers slightly favor positive numbers. So these are uniform between negative one and one. They're like that. And I'm going to say these numbers are not uniform between negative one and one, but are uniform between negative, uh, I don't want to make the two close, but let's say negative 0.8 and 1.2. So how do I do that? Uh, go here, or let me go here. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is regenerate this column of random numbers. So let me just change things right here. I'm gonna take um, this number, which is uniform between negative a half and a half, and I'm going to add uh, 0.1 to it. Uh, okay, 0.1. So this makes, if I do that, this makes it uniform between negative 0.9 and 1.1, and I can do it um, between negative 0.8 and 1.2 by adding 0.2 to it. So these numbers are no, would no longer be uniformly distributed between minus one and one because I, I'm adding 0.2 to every number. So you can see that biases the number on the positive side. Let me hit return. Okay, now I'll select this, copy it, now I'll go up here and now I'm going to take all of these things and put that new function into them by paste. And uh, oh, here, let me just do it the old fashioned way here. Didn't like that. There, OK. Let's see, it brought me way down here. I mean. Okay, let me come back up here. Value. Okay. Let me read this. So, all of these numbers here should have this formula in it, and they appear to have that formula in it. Okay, now let me rewrite this to be uniform from negative 0.8. To 1.2. There. Okay, so I hope you see that, how I did that and the logic behind it. So now I've generated random numbers uniformly distributed between negative 0.8 and 1.2. And uh, see my spreadsheet, I'm trying to unselect this. There, there, okay. So let me now grab 10 numbers out of this column and do an average. So let me go over here, right here. So I'm skipping column D, going into, into column E. So I wanna grab the first 10 numbers going from two to 11 and do an average and if I do an average, that average should be what the middle value is in this range. Um, the middle value between 0.8 and 1.2. And uh, what is that? 1.1? I mean, is that what it is? Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an average of 10 numbers. I'll put equal. Now there's an Excel function for doing this, but I'm gonna write it out. Equal sum. And the sum is going to go from C2, 
colon to C11. And now I hit return, and there I have C2 to C11. Ah, but I want to do an average, so let me go back up here and divide by 10. So I'm doing 10 numbers and doing an average. And right now, of these numbers going from here down to 11, it says this is the average. The average is 0 0.3449. So the average here is a little bit larger than the statistical average should be if these numbers were truly representative of this distribution. I'm getting the average is 0 0.3449. Uh, six, et cetera. OK, great. Um, now, average of 10 numbers. Now, let me, uh, if I did an average of these numbers here, I should get a number that's about zero. Uniformly between minus a half and a half should be about zero. Average of these numbers will be greater than zero, mostly. Sometimes I can do an average of 10 numbers and get a negative number. I could run some examples here, right? How do I do that? Type one, return. That's almost zero. Return there. I'm getting a negative number with the average of 10 numbers. So I generate a whole new set of numbers every time I do this. And you can see this, this number jumps way around. So if I were going to do a poll of 10 people to find out if they're positive people or negative people, the number I get here jumps around. I, I, 10 people doesn't seem to be nearly enough to determine whether most of the population is positive or negative. Okay, well, if 10 people isn't enough, how about 100 people? So let me do a poll of 100 people. So to do that, I'm going to average the numbers from 2 to 101. So I'll put equals sum, and I'm doing now um, C2 colon, C101 there, and now I'm going to divide by 100 because I'm doing 100 people there. So now I'm getting 0 0.1219. Now remember, I said I, the average with this distribution should be about 1 point, uh, um, I'm sorry, it should be about 0 0.1. Um, between negative 0.8 and 1.2. I think I said 1.1, but that was wrong. It should be about 0.1, right? You just add these two numbers and divide by two. And uh, so you get 1.1 divided by two, okay? So that, so this looks like this is a little bit closer estimate to the correct average than this one. Here, let, you know, let me just do that calculation. Here, let me go to my calculator. Here it is right here. OK, I want to do 1.1. I'm doing reverse Polish calculator. And uh, negative 0.8, so 0.8. And I'm looking for my, uh, I'll just subtract it rather than add negative 8 there. Now divide by 2. And uh, OK, 0 0.15, so there. So you see here, let's just for the fun of it, we do the average of this, we get 0.5, enter, and then 0.5, subtract, and you get 0, and you divide by 2, and you get 0. So the averages of these two are 0, but the average of this it's going to be the sum of these two. Do it again, 1.2, enter, 0.8, subtract. Uh, I don't know, did something wrong. 1.2, enter, 0.8, subtract. There, now divide by two. Now I'm getting 0.2, okay. 
who knows, you know, uh, I don't even know how to use a calculator. Okay, but this should be a number that's slightly positive. So this is a little positive, this is positive. Let's do another average, only this time, instead of averaging 100 numbers, I'm going to average 1,000. Now, you would think that the average of 1,000 numbers will be closer to the statistical average. Okay, now let's do this equals sum. Now let's do, I'll put um, C2 colon, and then I'll do a thousand and one. So, I'm sorry, C a thousand and one like that, parentheses, and divide by 1,000. Um, okay, so this is, this is 0 0.14, so it's slightly less than the average of 0.2. This is, uh, a, again, a little bit higher than this, a little bit closer with 100 numbers, but it's not what the theoretical value should be. Now this is pretty close. So doing a thousand, polling a thousand people to see if they're positive, negative, I can say that the people on average here are positive. So the, you see the more people I poll, the closer I'm getting to what the true value is. And when, when people do polls, this is what they call the statistical error of the poll, that the fewer people you poll, the more inaccurate the poll is. So this is a thousand. Well, let's let's try ten thousand equal sum C two colon, and then I'll do ten thousand and one there, and I'll divide by ten thousand. Okay, there's a problem with this formula. I'm not sure what it's not like. Oh, I know. I forgot the C here. Look at that. There. Okay, so this is 10 people. It's 100 people. It's 1,000, 10,000. Let's do the whole 100,000 here. C2 colon C100,001 and 1 and divide by 100,000 there. I forgot to put an equal sign there. That'll do it. There. So you see a couple things here. First of all, the numbers are not completely accurate. Even with 100,000, I'm not getting exactly the 0.2 I expect to get. And um, that, um, but there, they, you know, this is way off by a lot, and this is only off by uh, about, this is about 0.199, and it, we're saying the average should be 0.2, so this is accurate, you know, to 1, 1,000. So as I add more people in the poll and do the average, I'm getting a closer value. Polls typically aren't going to do 100,000 people. Uh, in fact, um, depending on how lazy the pollers are, they might only do 100 people. And um, 
So this is why polls don't always tell you how an election is going to turn out. And the statisticians have ways of estimating uh, how accurate polls are going to be based on how many people you, uh, you, you ask. And as you see, as we get more and more and more, the number becomes more accurate, but it's still not completely accurate. Let's, um, let, let me just do a, co a couple runs here. Now notice this is very, very close to 0.2, which is the two, true value. This is way off, which only has 10 people in it. This looks pretty good here, right in here. This isn't bad. I mean, these down here aren't too bad. This is still way off. So see how these numbers jump around. So you get some idea um you know how many people you have to uh, to do a poll on now polls aren't just for political races uh industrial engineers also in effect do polls uh if you have a business and you're manufacturing uh widgets and uh, you want to measure how good your Pro manufacturing process is every once in a while you you'll grab a widget and you'll test it and see if it's good or not and that way you get an idea are 99 percent of your widgets working right or or are um uh, you know how many of your widgets are working right by basically doing a poll 98 99 or is it even better than that? 99.9%. And uh, so uh, industrial engineers effectively use polling to determine how good their manufacturing process is. You're making cars. How many of your cars come off the assembly line with everything correct? So you can measure that. And you typically, in a manufacturing process, you strive to make your uh, your your process is a, as good as possible. And um, of course, then you could ask a question as you're manufacturing things, how many and how frequently should you take items and test them? Because possibly when you test something, um, you make it unsellable. And uh, so you don't want to take too many, but you want to take enough so that you get an accurate number. So this concept of doing polling on things is spreads across a large number of disciplines. Today, people are producing vaccines. How effective are the vaccines? You give uh, 10 people a vaccine and you check their antibodies and, and you say, we have 10 people, I get eight of them have enough antibodies to be immune to the virus. Is 10 people enough? Well, probably not. Uh, in the United States, I think that in their phase three trials for doing vaccines, the companies tend to use about 30,000 people. So here we see this is 10,000 numbers. Are we getting fairly accurate? Yeah, it's not bad, right? If the right number is 0.2 and um, we're getting uh, basically 0.21, that's pretty good. Uh, here, this is almost exact. 100,000 almost gives you exactly the right number. So 30,000 is probably going to be closer to this than, than that. So testing 30,000 people uh, on a vaccine trial looks like it gives you a pretty good idea of uh, whether your vaccine is working or not. So this is typically how these drug trials go. Now, I... Um, I think I told you last time that you know I myself personally I've signed up for a vaccine trial, and um, and they've already they've sent me an email and they've called me once. I'm waiting for them to call me back as they want to ask me questions uh, before they actually put me in the trial. I'm waiting for that. They haven't done it yet, 
Uh, and uh, but the, when they do vaccine trials, they want to have a representative population. So they want to have young people, middle-aged people, old people. They want to have people who might have different medical conditions and so on, so they can get some idea how the vaccine works for all these different people. And that's important. And so when they do a trial, uh, they, uh, they have to put in a mix of people, they get the results on the effectiveness of the vaccine. And then here in the United States, there's a, a government agency that will then look at these results and, and determine whether based on these results, is the vaccine both safe and effective? Now, the safety is a big part of it. Uh, uh, several years ago, I can remember when they came up with a vaccine for something or another, and, um, and there were some people in the test group who came down with something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a temporary paralysis. And uh, so <laughs> that doesn't sound like a, a good a side effect for a vaccine. You know, so what's acceptable? If 1% of the people get Guillain-Barre syndrome, that means if you test 10,000 people, what's 1% of 10,000? 100? Uh, that means 100 of those people are going to get Guillain-Barre syndrome. Is that acceptable? Would you get a vaccine? I wouldn't. Uh, and um, so testing whether the not only does the vaccine give you immunity, but are there minimum side effects is what they look for when they do these studies. So we can do simulations like this in Excel now uh, and determine, you know, uh, how many numbers we have to do in an average to get something that we're happy with. So you might say here, maybe, you know, this is like I said, this is 10, this is 100, this is 1,000. You might look at this and say, you know, 1,000 is pretty good. And you might be happy with a thousand people. Okay, it should be 0.2 with a thousand. I get 0.18. That's not too bad. Again, this one keeps coming in accurate, basically to the thousands place, right? Let me do another another one. There. So here, a thousand uh, gives me an average of 0.18. So that's a bit off. And uh, so maybe a thousand isn't enough. But I would, uh, and um, so you may look at some of this and decide, well, maybe I should go to 10,000. So that is uh, an example. And I, when I teach a probability and statistics course, um, I will use Excel and I will have, have students do examples like this to get some idea on when you're averaging numbers, how many numbers do you need to get an accurate estimate of the true average? Now, in statistics, there's something called the law of large numbers. And that tells you that the more people you take when you're doing an average, or the more numbers you take when you're doing an average, that you will get closer and closer to the true value on the average. And that's what we have seen right here. So in essence, what I'm demonstrating for you is in fact that the law of large numbers is true, that the more people or the more numbers we do when we do an average, the closer we get to the true value. Now, I said these, this one right here, the average on this should always be zero, and you may find that to be easier to see than this point too. So let, let, let me... Let me just change this if you don't mind. Let me just go back and redo these numbers for this column where we know the average has to be zero. So I, I cl click here and instead of putting C, I want to put B. So B, 
B, hit return. Okay, so that's B2 to B11. That average should be zero. Let me do this one. B2 to B101. Hit return there. See now some of these are coming up negative. Let me do this one. B. Let me do B here. Return. And then finally, so B, let me do B here, sorry, B, B is this one, and now this one, right here. OK, so when the average is zero, you can kind of immediately look at these numbers and, and because you, ideally the theory says they should be zero. Now, 10 look pretty good here. 100, not so good. 1,000 is better than 100. 10,000 is better than all of these up here so far. And 100,000 is pretty, pretty close to zero here. So doing make just looking at an average whether you know the average should be zero I is for us humans is intuitively more clear so I can generate more and more numbers this way and you see that as I'm doing the average of a hundred thousand versus ten thousand and so on that these averages get closer and closer to the theoretical value of zero now in statistics what people do is they then look at how these numbers vary to get uh, to get a estimate with how good the estimate is. So you want to measure the accuracy of your average. So what you do is you generate a bunch of these numbers, let's say, and then see how much these numbers vary. So you look at how much the numbers vary from the true value, which is what the variance gives you. And you take the square root of the variance and you get the standard deviation. So in statistics, they frequently will give you the mean of a random number and its standard deviation. And those two things together tell you how the numbers fluctuate and what, the, what their average value should be. So I thought, you know, if you're going to comms and media, if your goal is to um, do reporting, which might mean understanding data, that I would give you here a little lesson on how polling is done, how you determine whether polls are accurate. So if you're, someone tells you, well, we're, we did a poll on the, um, who's going to win the election and we found that candidate A is ahead by two percentage points. A leg legitimate question to ask is, well, how many people were in the poll and are you within the, um, uh, do you have a statistically accurate number? Is, are you in the, the precision or the accuracy of the poll? And usually, I think people take that to be, are you within plus one or minus one standard deviation? So if you're going to look at how these numbers vary and compute a standard deviation, is the number you're getting, you're getting here, is it within plus or minus a standard deviation? And then as, as it is, if it is, you would say, okay, that's statistically significant. So we would expect this to be a pretty accurate number. And um, so people will ask questions like that. Are you within the, the, the accuracy of the poll based on how many people you have polled? So if somebody tells you they've done a poll, ask them for uh, how many people were in the poll and you know, what is the statistical significance of the poll? And if they're and they should have statisticians doing these polls. If you know they just 
take some random guy who was working in a pizza place and ask him to do a poll, the chances are that person doesn't know how to do this computation and determine whether a poll is statistically significant. OK, so um, that is uh, m my quick lesson on generating random numbers. So hopefully you've seen how to generate a whole huge list of random numbers here. See that? I go all the way down here. I'm at uh, 593,000, and I'm still generating random numbers. So if you had to click and drag down to put functions in those cells, you'd still be doing it. And um, so generate lots of data, simulations of data, how you might analyze that data to see if what it's you expect it to be. And uh, so uh, I think you actually may not ever want to do this in practice, but it's a, a good way of studying this concept of statistical significance in polls. Okay, I, I don't have anything else to talk about here. Let's see if people might have questions. Hello, all you wonderful people here. So, okay, we got maybe a little bit more than half the class. That's pretty good statistically. You know, um, let's uh, see. Does so? I I talked about something that maybe you haven't seen much about before, and hopefully in classes, most of what you talk about in a class is not something you've seen before. Uh, otherwise, why take the class? So let me ask you guys, anybody have any questions about um, generating random numbers, generating lots of random numbers, and how you might uh, Gener how you might analyze these random numbers. Uh, I don't hear a lot of people commenting. OK, the sun's out here, but it's cloudy. And uh, while the weather here has been great for the past few days, um, in Florida, um, I, I say it's always too hot in Florida. You know, um, and um, and what what makes the hot difficult to tolerate is the level of humidity is so high. So I, I find the the summers here to be very hot and humid. Uh, I much prefer the winters here, where uh, I find the temperatures more tolerable and. Um, we're right at sea level next to the sea, so the humidity is, is tends to be high and it tends to be hot. Uh, you get up higher in elevation and typically the air is drier up higher, so I prefer uh, higher altitude. I actually prefer the way it was in Nairin, um, the altitude there, and even though it's pretty cold right in the dead of winter. Uh, I find uh, the summers in therein to be just about perfect for me. That's what I prefer. It's sunny. The air is dry. Uh, the temperature is about right. So I really like the summers in therein. OK. No questions. I don't hear anybody jumping in here. Certainly, everything that I've said is not perfectly 100% clear, is it? Maybe it is. Maybe people have logged in and they've gone somewhere else. Uh, of course, I've never done that. I've never logged into a meeting and then uh, turn off my camera and my microphone and then leave the meeting. Uh, 
boy, that would be an evil person who would do that. Um, and uh, although uh, I have to be careful not to leave with my camera on because frequently I don't have any pants on. Today, I, I mean, I have pants on, but you know, if I don't have pants on and I stand up, you know, that could be embarrassing. Um, so um, with that, no questions. Okay, I'll take that as no questions. Okay, I see. See, I usually don't have the questions on. Somebody had a question. Why do we need random numbers in Excel? Are there any examples? Um, I hope I answered that. I, I what I use random numbers for is when I run uh, engineering simulations, actually. But what I try to do here is give me an example of, I use the random numbers to show you the concept of uh, a statistical accuracy in doing a poll. So uh, that's maybe I should look at these questions that people write here. I don't. So I hope I answered that question. Okay, good. Um, okay, then, uh, people, um, I uh, I hope you're doing well. Um, I think m many of you are probably living at home with your families, and living with your families can be both positive and negative. Uh, and uh, so I hope that's doing well. I know you probably miss seeing your friends, and I certainly understand that. Um, now, I uh, I don't know if you connect with your friends online or not. I know uh, my two children who are living at home here with me, they are frequently online with their friends. Uh, they are online, they chat with their friends, uh, they go online because they're taking their classes online too. And they go online and they talk with other students in the classes and they, uh, they you know, send emails to their professors with questions and they even go online to do things like play Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know if you guys do something like that. That's a, it's an incredibly nerdy thing to do. It's been nerdy as long as people have been doing it, playing Dungeons and Dragons. And now they do it online. They all go on to a group, a video group chat, and they play Dungeons and Dragons, which, of course, I think playing Dungeons and Dragons, the goal really isn't to play Dungeons and Dragons. I think the goal is to get on with your friends and just talk about things. So, you know, it's uh, it's not unlike going out with your friends and you know, playing football or basketball or volleyball. You know, you go out there, you play the game, but you also spend a lot of time talking about things. So I've, I've observed in my my children that they get a lot of their social interaction online. It's not quite as good as doing it in person, but it's not bad. And in fact, once a week, um, I do a chat with two old friends of mine. These are two fellows, and they both happen to be professors. And I've known them both for almost 50 years. And uh, so we meet online once a week for about an hour. And um, we, we do uh, politically incorrect things and discussions uh about uh, our world you know we'll talk about politics we'll talk about uh the goofy things that people are doing and, and the goofy things that are happening in the world uh, we'll talk about um, how various universities are doing with their classes whether online or in person and uh, so we have a good discussion about once a week on that. Like I said, I've known these two fellows for about 50 years. And uh, 
So I meet with my friends online also. Okay, guys, um, I'll see you all next week. S stay safe, stay healthy, and, um, and that's it. So if you have a question, ask it now. Thank you, you too. Have a good day. Okay. Thank you all.